Namaste, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another session of Yoga Insights. So today's uh, Yoga Insights will feature the director of the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram, Srimati Nitya Jagannathan. So Nitya Ji is a senior yoga therapist from the Krishnamacharya tradition, and she was a student of the renowned Yogacharya Sri TKV Desikachar for over a decade. With over 20 years of teaching experience, she is currently the director of the KYM Institute of Yoga Studies in the training and certification wing of the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandira. She has traveled extensively around the world to teach yoga, yoga therapy, and Vedic chanting, and is a certified therapist from the International Association of Yoga Therapists. Nityaji is also currently on the certification committee of the IAYT. She is the chairperson of the IYA Tamil Nadu State Subcommittee for Academic Courses and Examinations, and she was honored with the Yogini Award by Tamil Nadu State by EduLife Vish. Vishipsa in, uh, in February this year. She is deeply passionate about all aspects of Indian literature, culture, and philosophy. Nrityaji is also the editor-in-chief of Darshanam, which is the quarterly journal on yoga and yoga chikitsa of the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram. She has also been featured in the Indica Yoga Global Festivals of Yoga and is always collaborating with us and it's always a pleasure to host Nityaji. In this session, uh, this session is an introduction to the Pakshi Kalpana Prakriya that explores the five-dimensional human system beyond which shines the Atma. Nityaji and Indika Yoga are hosting a weekend workshop to explore the Panchakosha model and its practical applications and this session will help you understand what is in store for you. Nityaji, will you please join the session? Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much for once again collaborating with Indika Yoga. It's always lovely to have you, Nityaji. Thank you so much, Sophia. It's always a pleasure to be with you. So I'm going to hand over the session to you now and I'll see all of you towards the end. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. And a warm welcome to all of you who've uh, signed up to attend this introductory talk on the Pakshikalpana model of the Taitriya Upanishad. This is intended to be an introductory talk only to be developed subsequently in the course that's coming up under the Indica Band. Let me start with an invocation before I. Sahana Bhavat Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavahai Tejasvinavati tamastu Mahidvishavai O Shanti 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 Shri Krishna Vagi Shayati Shwarabhyam Samprapta Chakrankana Bhasha Saram Shrinot Narangendra Yatau Samarpitaswam Shri Krishna Maryam Guru Varyamide Virodhi Kartike Mase Shatatara Krato Dayam Yoga Charyam Krishna Maryam Guru Varyamaham Gaje Krishna Suri Daya Patram Yanavai Ragya Bhushanam Shri Matvain Katanatharyam Vandeham Yoga Deshikam Shri Guru Pyo The Taitri Upanishad, as with all the other Upanishads, is replete with a lot of very beautiful insights both from a Vedic perspective, from a Vedantic perspective, as also from a practical perspective. This is the beauty of the Upanishads. And while they are essentially Vedantic, as I said in their import, how they apply to us, especially to our understanding of the human body, of our connection with the world outside and with the self within, is of significant interest to many of us, specifically practitioners of yoga, because this model can be used as a very sound base to design practices of yoga that are appropriate to the individuals 
who are uh, and the model can be applied the panchaposha model can be applied this is intent, intended entirely as an introductory level talk to be developed so please do not expect me to go deep into the model because it is a very elaborate uh, structuring and it will take me some time to detail each of this uh, i am going to be touching on the core anchor points of this model to be developed by me subsequent just give me a minute as i share my slides i will just turn my video off for just a second and i'll be back I'd like to state at the outset that this particular talk, this presentation is not intended to look at the Vedantic understanding. There are experts to do this, to go through the Bhashyas and uh, the, the various perspectives that the Bhashyas give. My purpose in this is not to do that because I am not an expert in Vedanta and therefore I would refrain from doing that. My purpose of this talk and the program that's coming up is to show practitioners of yoga and others as well how this model is relevant, relevant to our daily living, to the, to the way our body functions, to the breath and the nature of the breath, how the panchapranas affect us and going deeper into the mind and understanding of the multiple dimensions of the mind and therefore how we engage. How do we work with our relationships, with personal life and other commitments and all of this? And so it is more of an application uh, oriented application. This is an application oriented presentation, which is my outcome in this uh, course that is coming up. I'm going to introduce certain fundamental ideas here. Now, this model, uh, I call it a model. The Vedantic term is Prakriya which is essentially as we understand all the Upanishadic teachings to be they take up the central case of Brahman or Atman and in correlation to this, to this consciousness, to this cosmic consciousness or the individual consciousness, what is the relationship of the world of Jiva, Jagat, Ishwara and so on? And this model is no different. What it does is that it looks at the human body, the entire human system itself as a microcosmos, at the heart of which is the Jivatma. And you find this particular prakriya, it's called the Pancha Kosha Prakriya, also called Pancha Maya Kosha. Sometimes you see that terminology. It may also be stated to be Pancha Maya Prakriya. When you take the word Maya or Kosha, it indicates a sheath or a cover or a layer. And you could say something that holds kosha, something that holds or is a receptacle or something else. Here in this context, it is speaking of the five dimensions of the human body. I use the word dimension for want of a better translation. Because while the word kosha might imply a sheath or a bag, the moment we use that in English, it indicates, you could say, layer after layer, and these do not interact or intersect. But this is not how the Panchakosha operate in reality. Because while there are five dimensions, the, the boundaries between them are very, very permeable. They are constantly informing, influencing, impacting, learning from each other and fundamental to our existence. And so I prefer to use the word dimension of the body. And where is this found? The entire discussion appears in the Taittiriya Upanishad, Brahmananda Valli and Bhriguvalli. The model is introduced in the Brahmananda Valli, which is the second chapter. 
developed further in the typical upanishadic conversational mode in bhrigoval and here i must say that we must remember that it is a vedantic model front and center it is a vedantic model that yoga teachers can borrow we can use it as a way of looking at the body please note it is not a yogic model it is a vedantic model what does it look at it envisions this multi layered human as i've indicated using the nesting dolls doll within doll within doll till you reach the last doll which is an indivisible unit and roughly this is what the panchakosha prakriya presents for what purpose for us to navigate the dimensions of the body to realize that which is not annamaya pranamaya manomaya vijnanamaya nanatamaya so the the idea is essentially the same neti neti principle of the upanishad where we take up the annamaya annamaya is the gross physical body i will explain about each of these as we move on understand the annamaya to be pervaded by the atman but the atma is not just confined to the annamaya and therefore the question comes then what and therefore pranamaya and it's how atma floods or pervades the pranamaya but atma is present or manifest in pranamaya but pranamaya cannot be stated to be equal to atma and so on the idea of manomaya being equated to the atma the atma being equal to manomaya this is the discussion and then the answer a point of reflection of uh, contemplation to say that yes manomaya is pervaded by the atma and yet is not the atma and so the five dimensions are taken up for consideration discarded and then one step deeper is going we go deeper in until we reach the point of the purusha or the atma or the jivatma consciousness that which inhabits this sharira comprising five distinct dimensions and as a vedantic model heavily commented upon by all the bhashyakaras very applicable to yoga and to life and we must also this is the angle that i'd like you to explore while not forgetting that it is an upanishadic model aimed at arriving at brahman as the source the realization of brahman and how it happens through a very elaborately thought out process of inquiry now what is significant about this about the pancha kosha prakriya it is also called the pakshi kalpana prakriya pakshi kalpana it takes on the imagery of a bird and very unique to the brahmananda valley we don't find this kind of imagery in the other upanishadic teachings there are other imageries you have the chariot of the kathopanishad you have the inverted ashwatthama tree of the shvetashvatara you have the dwasuparna you have the two birds uh, seated again shvetashvatara and so on but this model is unique unique very very beautiful why is it unique because it takes up this concept of five dimensions each of those is presented as comprising five components so we have five koshas each having five components and those five components are superimposed on the structure of a bird very clearly there is the head the two wings the right and the left wing the atma here is referring to the torso where the upanishad speaks here in this context please be very clear that the word atma atman can take different meanings depending on context of usage here how it is used is to indicate the core part of the bird or the body or torso of the bird that connects all the other parts it is not intended in the usage as atma consciousness it is atma as the center or the hub you could say of the torso of the bird so the head the two wings the center and the tail and each of these five components is superimposed on this and in a specific with a specific purpose because when you look at the bird or when you when we say birds in flight the head is pradhana this is what shankara's commentary also says 
pradhana without the head you have a dead bird it is the head that sets direction it is the head where the eyes are and it is through this vision that the bird flies so the head occupies a space of pradhanyam naturally we are speaking of a bird and therefore the word bird flaps its wings to fly both wings are equally important a bird cannot fly with one wing and so the right and the left wings as the major functional components that defines the bird as a creature of flight then you have the tail and one might assume the tail is you know least significant and so it's right at the bottom of the bird very interestingly even from a very practical physical perspective the tail is essential for the bird to navigate in flight for it to fly fly for it to streamline its flight path and to fly easily the shape the contour of the tail and the work done by the tail becomes very important and therefore presented as pucham the tail atma as i mentioned is the torso now why this model is interesting here i am entering into the domain of application asking ourselves this question what does it mean for us to fly what does it take to fly and why flight this is another question we have to ask ourselves this is concept of flight is something i think that has greatly held the attention of humans for millennia the mechanics of flight what is it that allows the bird to fly when when we walk we are terrestrial what causes this aerial flight of the bird and therefore from there the questions what kind of birds fly and we see that the peacock which is such a stunning bird a bird of great beauty if you look at the size of its tail you compare it to the rest of the body the tail is sometimes double the length of its body and yet beautiful magnificent no doubt and yet it is a bird that has a very heavy tail and so this is not you know one of those uh, very graceful uh, soaring birds the peacock flies but it flies for limited distances and you can't very well compare the flight of a peacock to say the soaring of an eagle or a hawk or any other such bird of prey and what is the difference the difference is in the body structure specifically in the tail and therefore the questions that as i studied this model uh, with my teacher shivesika char and as we were taught to apply it from the perspective of the yoga sutra and yoga therapy these are the questions that come up why what will what what will enable flight what does flight mean to me here in my body what does that spirit of flight embody and we see that it is a sense of letting go of being unbound of breaking free from some kind of fetters or bonds that keep us earth bound and where do you feel this you feel it at the level of the body because this earth is the karma bhumi we are here to fulfill a certain karma there is no doubt about this so how is it that i can bring my body my mind my senses to function in such a way that i feel unfettered unfettered and free without being bound and therefore this model becomes very significant and over the years as i have sat and studied this model the connections between every dimension the panchakoshas is something that has uh, always left me with a sense of awe at the innate intelligence of these masters in coming up with the conceptualization lens that none of these assignments to the different parts of the bird nothing is random there is no randomness it's an extremely well thought out model it looks at the bird itself as the living bird the flying bird as its metaphor it takes into account the function performed by the head by the wings by the torso by the tail and based on those functions components are assigned in each of the dimensions what is the goal the goal is to not be bound by any of these panchamayas not to be limited see the problem is with sadhana the goal is to let go of our identification obsession preoccupation with this human form body 
mind, intellect, senses, breath, all of this. And much of our identity relies so heavily on this. And the Upanishad's purpose is to help us go beyond. And uh, towards the end of the Taitri Upanishad Bhrigavalli, you see that the, the student has understood this. And so the Upanishad says, Annamayam Atmana Upasankramati. Pranamayam Atmana Upasankramati. Manomayam Atmana Upasankramati. Vijnanamaya Atmana Upasankramati. Anandamaya Atmana Upasankramati. It, the one who, is, who has transcended or crossed over the limitations of that Maya or that dimension or identity with that to realize the nature of the Atman that is within. And therefore, this is a very, very beautiful point. What is presented is this. How it is presented is this. They are two very different ideas. We look at both. Panchamaya, five dimensions, five layers or Panchakosha. Outermost, you have the Annamaya. And the Upanishad says, I have demonstrated it as a circle, as concentric circle, simply for understanding. The Upanishad says, Urushamaya, it is of the form of the human. And so my Annamaya is in my form. The Pranamaya is in my form. And they are dimension within dimension. You could say smaller and smaller and smaller. But they take the form of that embodied human entity only. The outermost dimension is the Annamaya. Annamaya or Annarasamaya. That aspect or dimension of the human system that is nourished by food. Food essence, Annarasam, pervades the body, constituting the Annamaya. This is everything in the body. The Sapta Datu of Ayurveda. The head, from head to toe, you have the skeletal structure, you have the muscular structure, you have the tendons, the sinews, the nerves, all this that is constituting that gross physical body is the Annamaya. But this body would just be a body. They would just be objects were it not for the vitality provided by the prana. Seen here as prana and also as the breath. You have to understand it as both. Prana as Atma Sakha, the closest friend and companion of the Atma and the visible, tangible manifestation of the presence of Atma is Prana as bioenergy or vital energy, but it also can be understood as the breath because Prana moves through the vehicle of the breath. Breath is vital to our life and as long as this Prana exists inside of us, life is said to be present. That moment where prana departs is what we pronounce as death. Yavat prane stito dehe tavat jeevana mujyate. When the maradam tasya nishkranti, that moment where the prana leaves, at that moment is when death sets in. And so when we speak of the annamaya, we have to speak of the pranamaya as well. Now, how do you divorce them? They are presented as two dimensions, but it is the pranamaya that is actually flooding throughout the anamaya. And for me to talk, for you to listen, for our eyes to blink, for the heart to beat, for hair to grow, for the various uh, you know excreta that form in our body, whether it is ear wax or uh, mucus that comes from the throat, everything happens under the function of the pancha prana. Otherwise, we are just entities. You are just corpse like and so there is a strong meshing of Annamaya and Pranamaya. Though the model presents it as separate, you cannot separate. There is no Annamaya functionality without Pranamaya. This is the second dimension. Then we come to the third, which broadly we speak of in English as the mind. Now, just calling it the mind is one thing. We have only that one term in English, which limits us. But what the Upanishad and what many of these teachings have done is a very nuanced understanding of the mind and therefore a categorization of the mind in terms of the functions that is performed. We must remember here it is still one mind and I also wish to state here that the mind is not equal to the brain. The brain is a part of the mind of the, in, when you look at yogic anatomy, 
the mind is the superset the brain is a sub function it's a subset and so at the level of manu mayam we are speaking essentially of that aspect or function of the mind where there is an engagement through the senses to the world outside and there is a receipt of input through the sense organs again the gnanendriyas and the karmendriyas come together in their functioning the mind is receiving inputs all the time about the sensory objects that are being sensed by the mind that point of reception is the manomaya the mind that is in most closest proximity to the senses therefore receiving storing processing retrieving all of these data we are essentially we are storing data and so that process of cognition storage retrieval is in the manomaya but there is we are not robotic creatures to be functioning as programmed there are deeper aspects to the mind itself that will determine or will influence how the mind receives processes and stores and so this is the vijnana maya vijnana jnana is loosely very loosely we say knowledge the jnana higher knowledge though that's not a great translation you could understand it as the intellect a deeper underlying intellect that is responsible for the quality of cognition how i have been taught to understand it through my acharyas is to understand it as unique aspects of an individual's personality swabhava the swabhava the very unique defining nature of an individual sits here why i do what i do is an outcome of how my vijnana maya functions i will give you an example to show you the difference between the manomaya and the vijnana maya of course shankara bhashya gives us a lot of ideas it speaks about uh, the theoretical and the practical application it speaks about uh, knowing something and then to do it with understanding the different perspectives but to give it to you very simply at a school or a fundamental high school level you see that what we study is essentially the same we might belong to different educational boards that's that's immaterial but all of us learn 1 plus 1 is 2 or 2 times 2 is 4 or 6 divided by 2 is 3 or we learn the basic rules of grammar in whichever language it is some rudimentary aspects of history geography uh, math physics chemistry and so on the core learning is the same the core storage is also the same that nobody is going to remember if we learn h2o2 hydrogen one oxygen makes water at the manomaya level it's all the same we all understand it the same way what do we do with this knowledge we study the same things but we don't all become mirrors or clones of each other all of us doing the same kind of job there's such a variety in terms of our aptitude our interests what we choose to do and why we do all of this sits in the vijnana maya this is the seat of our mahat of the vasanas of the samskaras all this is seated in the vijnana maya this i will explore deeper when i go into the course because the vijnana maya from my experience and work is where truly we can effect transformative uh, processes deep contemplation and changes of behavior changes of samskara can be facilitated at the vijnana maya provided the care seeker is cooperative i'll give you another example because this difference is very important cigarette smoking is injurious to health tobacco is injurious to health i think at a manomaya level almost everyone is aware of this regardless of how literate or illiterate we are we see that products that contain tobacco have very clear graphic illustrations indicating the outcomes of uh, addiction to tobacco in any form for cancer and very very disturbing images are placed at a manomaya level we are seeing it we are cognizing it the billboard say it when you see someone smoking in a in a movie immediately you have a subtitle that says cigarette smoking is injurious to health and so on we know it and yet 
if you look at the sheer volume of the tobacco industry that runs into billions and billions of dollars yearly, why, if you ask the question, why would this industry thrive when you know that it is a direct cause of cancer? The answer lies in the Vijnanamaya of all those individuals for whom this becomes a samskara, this becomes a pattern, an addiction, a habit that is very hard to shake. And why is it hard to shake? The cue lies in understanding the components of the Vijnana Maya. Deeper still, and naturally here, your nature, your personality is going to impact how you receive input. And this is how that, you know, you see that that one within another, the Vijnana Maya, within that umbrella, you have the Manomaya. So the, my capacity to cognize, to experience is highly dependent on the nature of my personality, my Swabhava, which is why given X incident, it could be any incident that 10 people are a witness to, there will be 10 different witness accounts of the same event because they are processing it differently at the Vijnana Maya. Going deeper is the Ananda Maya. Again, um, as a teacher, I very often struggle with coming up with the right translations. And unfortunately, we always fall short with words like Ananda. How do you explain Ananda? We have words like ecstasy, joy, bliss. But I feel that all of these don't suffice. Because Ananda at its core is a state, it is a state of deep joy, great joy. But it is also a space of extreme tranquility, of the utmost serenity, calmness, equanimity, balance. It can also be the space of extreme grief. That is how you experience it. That is where you experience it. To be established in Ananda implies a capacity of the mind to neither be pulled this way or that way by Sukha and Dukkha. A state that is not colored by the changing Sukha and Dukkha is Ananda, no doubt. And therefore you say blissful, but I would prefer to use the word serene or tranquil or calm. Ananda Maya is that aspect of the human mind where the deepest and most potent of our experiences are felt. And so it is hard to understand again requires much delving into to understand what is this ananda? What is it that gives me happiness? And the model explains it so beautifully. You see that as you go into the Panchakosha Prakriya using the Pakshi Kalpana, it takes up every one of these dimensions going deeper and deeper and deeper. And there the answers appear to why uh, the Ananda Maya is the space of great joy. And when one is not able to experience, when you're not able to connect to that object that gives you this joy, it can become a space of deep sorrow as well. Within all these, within the Panchamaya or the Panchakosha is the Purusha, the Atma, that which is beyond. All this is of Prakriti, nature, matter. The consciousness that is within is the Atma which is verily as per the teachings of the Vedanta, that which is the being in the sun, that which illumines the sun is the Atma that illumines our heart space. It is what keeps the world and this body functioning. Even when your mind is asleep, the processes of the body continue unabated. Why do they do it? It's because of the flow of prana. But why does the prana flow this way? It is because the presence of the Purusha. And it is this core that remains a constant. It's Nitya, Amrita. These are the beautiful words that the Upanishads use. In spite of changes occurring, the nature of the universe has changed because it is made up of the three gunas. The Atma within is untouched by the three gunas, remains a constant witness to the change that occurs in the body and outside. And therefore, the Upanishad says, what is that from which all the states of consciousness proceed? What is that by which all manner of sensory functions are experienced, which itself is beyond the mind, which itself cannot be grasped, cannot be seen, cannot be smelt, 
and yet it allows us to do all that. And through this process of questioning, we arrive at the idea of the Atma as what is within. That is the journey of the Panchakosha Prakriya. But I'm going to leave that part aside. That is, that is essentially the Vedantic teaching and the model is about this journey of first understanding the importance of the Atma in the functioning of each Maya, but also then through a process of reflection, realizing that the Atma pervades, but the Atma is not equal to Anamaya, Pranamaya, etc. It lies apart, it lies within. And so from there, it of course takes a Vedantic perspective of this is the nature of the Atma. Now that is not the concern. Now that has been dealt with and that is not the area that I'm going to touch on. It is the others, the other five dimensions. What are these? What does this model have to reveal to us about the five Oshas? Very briefly, I will touch on these. Each of them has to be expanded because what the Upanishad gives us is literally like, a, it's like a small puzzle. It just gives you five sets of phrases for each model. The commentaries are extensive and you have to go deep to understand these interconnections and how we can work. More importantly, knowing it is one thing. How do I work at that dimension? What are the tools that yoga can offer us to work at the Anamaya? What are the different ways of working at the Anamaya? How do we understand and work at the Pranamaya level? What tools can support me at the Manomaya level? How can I deploy the same tools of yoga to alter my deeper inline samskaras? And finally, what can I find in the process of learning yoga that will address my needs at an Anandamaya level that will effect a transformation so that at every dimension of the body, that bird is capable of free flight, of free Un unhindered, unfettered flight. What is? What can I do so that this whole body is able to fly? Maybe not actually, but notionally. That sense of lightness, that sense of simply soaring without anything limiting me. How do I bring this to the body, mind and senses? This is what the course will explore from a practical perspective. As I mentioned, the Annamaya is where the model itself is introduced. Very clear. It just says, there is this bird. At the Annamaya level, understand it to be of the form of the human. But on this human body, you superimpose a bird. Not very hard to do. Because if you if you are able to stretch your imagination a little bit, you have the head. You have the two uh, sides of the body. You have the right hand, the left hand, right leg um, and the left leg. You could envision them as being pakshas, the sides. You have the torso and you have the lower part, the where the legs taper down. So you could broadly try to, if you imagine a little bit, you can superimpose this. It simply says at an Anamaya level that there is a head, two wings, the torso and the tail. And this is the Anamaya level, the metaphor of the Anamaya. Now, when you go deeper, we will understand how at the Anamaya, what keeps this functioning is Annam. And therefore, the importance of food science, what Ayurveda has to say about it, what the Bhagavad Gita has to say about this. So much of interest. What can I do to make my body healthy, supple, active, energetic, flexible, strong, ready to face up to any challenge? These are what we have to discuss. The, each of these, as I said, will open up a door for further discussion. This is at the level of the Annamaya. Very self-explanatory. At this point, the model is very straightforward. When you come to the pranamaya bird, it says, tasya prana eva shiraha, the vital prana itself is the head of the bird. Vyana and apana are the right and the left wings because vyana is that aspect of the prana that causes circulation. It's, you could say, logistics manager. It is what moves everything in the body, whether it is the movement of um, oxygenated uh, blood into the different cells, the removal of deoxygenated blood, the moving of food essence, the removal of food waste, of metabolic waste, all this happens, circulation happens through the function of the Vyana. And Apana is extremely important as a counterpart to Prana. As prana keeps us alive. Equally, Apana keeps us alive because Apana is that function of the Prana that eliminates, it keeps moving things out 
throws out what the body does not require so that there is no buildup of toxicity. Now you have two terms here that are not anything to do with the pranas. You have akasha and prithvi. Akasha literally is space, prithvi is earth. And one wonders why are there only three pranas mentioned? Why are the other two left as the earth and space? And therefore, when we go deeper into the commentaries, it opens out another revelation where Akasha is connected to Samana, the space within which the Panchapranas work. The Samana is the seat here at the navel, which is the seat of the Jataragni. And it, you could say Saman, Samam Nayati Iti Samana. It is that which keeps the whole body in a state of homeostasis. And therefore, that space is the space that is mentioned here. And the word Prithvi is connected to Udana. And we will explore later in the course itself how Udana connects to Prithvi through the idea of karma. Because the Prarabdha karma is what brings us here to this earth. And we are earth bound to finish this karma. And we will, if the Panchaprana stay within us for as long as this karma is operative. But when that burden of the Prarabdha that we have to fulfill when that comes to an end, it is Udana that activates, that leads the Atma out along with the other Pranas. And so, very interestingly, that connection is made between Udana and the Earth, the Earth being the Karma Pum. And so, that is how the Pranamaya bird is envisioned. Going on to the Manumaya bird, as I mentioned, the Manumaya is essentially about our cognitive processes highly dependent on the input coming through the Jnanindriyas and the Karmindriyas. When you look at the bird, again it might seem paradoxical. It gives you the four Vedas. Tasya Yajureva Shiraha, Riddakshina Pakshaha, Samotara Pakshaha, Atharvangirasa Pucham Pradishta. The four Vedas are clearly positioned there. Adesha Atma, the core of the bird is Adesha. Instruction you could say. Now, what does this have to do with Manumaya? We are speaking about cognition. We are speaking about sensory processes. We are speaking about perception of different objects through the senses and the transmission of that information to the, to the brain, which uh, basically sorts it out in different ways. And then there is a storage. There is memory you are retrieving uh, based on what has already been understood. And there is a practical application because all of this is happening through the mind. But we must remember that we are looking at Manome essentially in the context of what is known, what is being received, what is being given to us by the senses. And we must not forget that the model of education in the period of the Upanishads is essentially a Vedic one. And the subject that is to be studied are the four Vedas. Yajur Veda is a call to action because uh, this is the, some beautiful connects that you see between the Karmakanda and the Jnanakanda, the Yajurveda essentially is about the performance of a variety of uh, rituals, the Yajnas, the Homa, so many things that have to be done. It's an action-oriented component, which is supported by, you could say, I, again, a lot of this, I am simplifying, you could say it is supported by the theoretical framework of the Rig and the Samaveda mantras, uh, because these are essentially propitiatory mantras. They are mantras to invoke the devatas. Having invoked them, what do you do? You deploy the Yajurveda mantras in the performance of different yajnas. So there is the study component and there is an action component. There is also to balance this. You also have the idea of atharvangarasa. And here you have the idea of uh, so many times we do actions uh, unknowingly, unknowingly, rightful actions, wrongful actions, harmful, uh, punya karma, papa karma. And sometimes there is a need for a prize chitta, that there are errors that are made. And there is a larger, we should also look at our life per se, that there is the, the notion of, you know, living well, of healthy life, of how do we you know, defend our uh, territory. So many other ideas, you could say that some of them might be miscellaneous to the yajna itself, but they are essential to life. And therefore, that becomes the Atharvangirasa, the Atharva Veda component. All of this is the subject of what we are putting into the mind as content of the mind. And the core is Adesha. Adesha can be interpreted here as the teachings of the Brahmanas because the Brahmana portion of every Veda contains detailed in injunctions 
but even that has to be learned only through the guru so the guru mukha adhyayanam becomes very important so the teacher and the teachings communicated by the teacher can also be considered to be adesha because you need a source by which the knowledge is acquired so there is education there is a practical application of that knowledge and it all of this is based on what we are exposed to through our various sensory processes this is the manomaya when you go to the vigyanamaya bird this is one of my favorites in this model the whole model is one that i am deeply passionate about you see that shraddha marks the head of the bird the tail of the bird is mahaha mahaha here represents the sum total think as swami dayananda saraswati so beautifully elucidates says it's the sum total of all that has been experienced the sum total of knowledge of beliefs of thought processes samskaras vasanas all this collects together it aggregates together not just in one lifetime this is coming from lifetime after lifetime there are so many embedded vasanas and a lot of them are they are constantly churning because the purpose of our life is the extinguishing of these vasanas but they churn in different ways and very often you could see that the power of the prarabdha brings us to crossroads multiple choices have to be made probable choices which will i choose how will i choose it depends on the state of my mind there and you have ritam and satyam as the wings of the bird because this is where that process of understanding what is ritam what is that absolute incontrovertible truth of the brahman that is what i'm seeking what is satyam what is the truth in my communication in my uh, understanding in my engagement the commentary tells us ritam is at the level of knowing at the level of comprehending that truth of brahman satyam is how that truth is communicated and we have to navigate these two they are on two sides and it is this our grasp of ritam and satyam that will enable us to process what is being churned by the mahat but this is not easy the whole process itself is one that is very very challenging and this is why shraddha is needed and so shraddha becomes the head of the bird because where there is shraddha shraddha van labhate gnanam says the bhagavad gita it is shraddha that allows you to push through similarly the yoga sutra says shraddha virya smriti samadhi pragya purvaka itaresham shraddha becomes a major driving force that unshakable conviction in the words of the teacher in the tradition it say shastreshu guru vakyeshu astikya buddhi shraddha that and uh, uh, you could say that it is um, faith pending confirmation this is how i have heard it taught by a great master that there is something that the teachers the masters of the past experienced that is the content of the prolific literature the teachings that we have we are yet to experience it we are not resonating at that wavelength but until such time that becomes my truth can i hold on to it can i hold on to it with conviction with clarity with courage and can we be dhira this is that idea firmness unwavering resolve which is shraddha which is needed because this is where our uh, we can be fall into these various samskara traps and uh, at the heart of the vigyanamaya bird is yoga where um, shankara bhashyam tells us this is samadhana buddhi a state of reconciliation that there are going to be so many things that are happening can i reach a point of samadhana of reconciliation of attention of holding all this together from clarity attention and simply presence because that will determine the choices we make and through that the outcomes that are to form again here i must reiterate we are just touching the iceberg i'm just touching on these as anchor points each of these has to be further elaborated for which we don't have time in this session the session is intended only as an introduction lastly ananda maya i'll just complete in the next few minutes again very beautiful very very thoughtful model you have this idea of priya moda and pramoda very loosely if you were to translate it they all mean affection or shades of love different shades of love and when you go into the commentaries you see subtle differences that priyam is that great affection that you have a sense of affection to any loved object like us like a beloved child that that moment there is that thought of that to whom you have so much 
of a love to so much of an affection to there is a surge of ananda it can happen with objects it can happen with people you might also have priyam towards some delectable uh, dish and your uh, there is uh, saliva secretion all this is at that moment where you think of it there is a sense of uh, delight what if this were aggregated if it was multiplied becomes more it that is called moda and when that moda even multiplies further it is pramoda now to put it very practically suppose you have a child who has gone away on a trip or has gone away to study and you're seeing your child after a very long time it could be a span of 3 months perhaps when you have never been separated and so i'm i'm giving you very very practical life level examples the thought of this child coming back home itself gives you a sense of anticipation that is priyam and you go to receive the child you you're receiving your son or daughter at the airport and you see him or her walking towards you from the arrival point where there is a slight aggregation that there is an increase in that anticipation and the joy of welcoming this child home at that moment when the child has come to you you've embraced your child there is a, again a heightening of that which is pramoda that is how the model presents it but the heart of all these experiences is ananda where is it coming from it is coming from one space in the mind and what is the source of all these experiences they might have different degrees the different degrees of ananda sometimes they are object related sometimes they are sensual sometimes sexual sometimes it is just here and gone ephemeral but it doesn't matter the collective of all these experiences come from one source brahma pucham pratishta and that source is the brahman because brahman is ananda swarupa and a little bit a little sliver of that ananda is what we experience at the deepest level of our mind of the mind that is in proximity to this brahman the sense of uh, quietness and settle settling that you have after a good night sleep how do you express that joy when you feel that that sense of being refreshed or being well rested it is there that you feel that ananda at the deepest dimension and that indeed as the brahman says the upanishad it is emerging from the brahman and it pervades the system giving rise to all manner of experiences and as i mentioned where violet speaks of this idea of heightening of joy you must remember the opposite also very often we are in times of great ptsd depression is uh, making a mark across the world i think uh, significant uh, shifts are occurring with psychological illnesses even overtaking other illnesses such as diabetes or hypertension and so this is serious that there is somewhere a disconnect an incapacity to connect to moments of ananda therefore we succumb to the grief to the depression to the uh, to the sense of regret overwhelming sense of regret and therefore what can we do because that is not our natural state our natural state is this profusion of ananda of that serenity and so what can we do to get into that state realizing that that is our true nature again this can be explored through a number of techniques so this is very broadly in a nutshell just about running to time i close here these are the five birds of the pancha kosha as presented in chapter 2 brahmananda valli of the taittiriya upanishad i will stop here for questions with the promise that this will be explored in detail in the course that comes up for Let's take some time for your questions Namaste everyone thank you so much nitya ji for that beautiful session and those beautiful explanations it's, it it was so lovely listening to you um as nitya ji said we are open for questions now so if anyone has any questions please uh, just type them in the q and a and uh, while you guys think of questions if um anyone would like to get in touch with nitya ji to get more information about her work and the lovely work that is being done at the kym koti ji will be sharing her address in our chat box so you can access it there i think we have uh, 
question. Please share the link for registration. Mohanji is asking. Mohanji, we will share this also in the chat box. Koti ji will put up uh, the link where you can register for uh, Nritya ji's upcoming retreat with Indica Yoga. There we go. Uh, Koti ji has put in the chat box, uh, chat box Nritya ji's email address. Also, Koti ji, the link where people can register for the uh, event, please. Uh, Preeti Pandya ji is saying absolutely brilliant. She would like to learn this further. So Preeti ji, please access the link. And, and the best news is as of now, this is a residential workshop, but we're probably going to turn it into an online workshop because we have been getting many requests where people want to attend, but are limited because it's a residential workshop. So please go to the Indica Yoga website and very soon we will share how you can also attend this online, the longer version of the introduction that Nritya ji just gave us in the chat box. Koti ji has just put up uh, the link where you can get more information about her workshop. And please be a little bit patient with us in the next 24 hours or maximum two days, we will update these details so you can also attend online. Then we have Gopika ji who's asking, are Sukha and, An Sukha and Ananda are different, right? So how can meeting a beloved bring Ananda? The point there is, it's a very valid question. Very often we conflate Sukha and Ananda, we confuse also. Sukha implies the possibility of a change. It can go into Dukkha. Dukkha implies the possibility of Sukha. Ananda is a state that is not touched by either of these. The beauty of this Upanishad says that all these states, whether it is Sukha or Dukkha or is immaterial, they are underpinned by a core of Ananda that is our nature. And so you try to access, try to reflect on those moments of joy. Understand that the joy it brings you is still ephemeral. It's still in your mind. But the source of all this, the source that makes it possible to experience this is eternally Ananda. And which is why it says Ananda Atma. The nature of that experience at core is Ananda. Where does it come from? It comes from the Brahman. Seems like a paradox, but the answers come through when you go into the text itself. Thank you so much, Gopika uh, ji. I hope that answers your question. Uh, we have an anonymous attendee who's always attending our talks. Thank you so much for your support. He is asking, he or she is asking, does yoga have tool for each of the koshas? Yes, that is the intention behind the course where we map tools and we practice them. And we see how those tools can impact each of these dimensions. From a practical perspective, see, that is how I see as a yoga practitioner, that bridge that becomes very necessary. Because if we are able to comprehend at, a, at the level of what the Vedantic teachings are, that is different. It is a, it is a, it's a deep introspective inquiry. Very important. I'm not denying that at all. But many of us struggle with the practicality of it. How do I bring this into my life? And that is where I see that yoga offers some remarkable techniques that lend us the space to reflect, that gives us some awareness of the body, of the breath, how we can work with the mind, how do I develop uh, certain capacities of the mind, how do I understand the processes that are happening, what is being triggered, where is it coming from. And so yoga has methods that will help us. And so in the Krishnamacharya approach, we use the Panchakosha Prakriya as a base for the application of the yoga tools. Thank you. Uh, Sumanji has written, thank you, Indika Yoga and Madam. Thank you, Sumanji, for watching and joining us. Shittiji is asking, will you get a recording video of this session? Yes, absolutely. All of our sessions are recorded. So you can access uh, this session on the Indica Yoga website, the Indica Yoga YouTube channel, as well as our social media. So please, you can always come back, revisit this, learn from it again, and please share it with friends and family. Anupam Pandeji is saying this is a very motivational session, who is also a regular at Yoga Insights. Thank you for your support, Anupam Ji. And also also, uh, Shittish Ji, Koti Ji has just put the YouTube link where this uh, session will be available for you to share and you can always revisit it. Um, I don't see any more questions. So before we sign out, Nritya Ji, any message you'd like to leave us with or advice? I would, uh, I don't know if I'm qualified to give advice, but uh, uh, over the years, what I have come to realize is that 
there are such treasures in our uh, Bharatiya Sanskriti. The, the Jnana Parampara of our masters has given us everything that we need. Unfortunately, we're looking in the wrong places for solutions to problems. See, the problems are timeless. As long as there have been humans, we've had the same kind of problems. But there are very, very effective, very powerful coping strategies. See, the point is not that your problems will disappear. That's not going to happen. We are here as uh, karmic beings. We are coming with the karmic debt. You are dead. You have to close that debt. But can I do it well? Can I use the time that I have? Can I channelize this so that I walk this path with confidence, with courage, with certainty, without succumbing to the pressure? And what I've realized is this is a this is a treasure. So much there is that we don't know that we should explore. And so I would more than advice, I would say I would request that try to access these authentic sources, access authentic teachers, because not everyone knows the Sanskrita, not everyone knows the original, which is okay. But go for teachers who are authentically translating this so that we can integrate this in our uh, life. This is what I would like to share. Because this is my passion and I believe that, I firmly believe that it is also my dharma to share this because this is the abundance I have been blessed to receive. And I would like as many of people as possible to learn and to benefit from this. Thank you so much. That's great words of wisdom. And I really hope that happens because, you know, I was listening to this talk by Swami Chinmayananda a few days ago. And uh, one of the things he was known for saying is let's, convert us Indians into our own culture again and that is so true because we have become so aspirational where now I know Indians who go to the west to study yoga you don't need to do that when you have access to the best in India why do you want to settle for less you yes. know something that really needs to change and I don't mean to disrespect anyone from the west I'm sure no that the teachers they come to India they study but what you will get in India, in an ashram, in an authentic parampara, sampradaya, lineage, that you cannot compare that to one individual because it comes from generations of knowledge. You know, our ancient knowledge systems are sacrosanct. You can't mess with that. It loses its essence. And they are based on observation. They are not speculation. Yes. So we see that, as you say, Sophia, you know, we have ideas like gut biome today. We've known about gut biome for millennia. Ayurveda has spoken about gut biome. We've spoken about gut brain axis. We speak about polyvagal uh, response and uh, parasympathetic response. This is what pranayama and meditation target. And there's a question here from Rajshri Vasudevan. Yes, about I was how just going to refer to that. Yeah, please. About, are there any limitations to asana? And here I must say that uh, we must remember that asanas can be adapted. The Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram approach is entirely adaptable to the individual. So yes, there are uh, ailments that might pre prevent certain postures from being done. There are ways and means of changing the function. You change so that they experience the function of the posture without forcing anyone to do the posture. And therein lies the strength of the KYM approach, which is also a part of that is what is intended to weave it to through the the study of the theory with supplemented with the practice is what the content is going to thank you so much and there's a whole bunch of comments and a lot of gratitude being expressed from our participants thank you so much for everyone who's participated and joining uh, before we leave, Koti Ji, will you just uh, share the poster of uh, Nritya Ji's residential workshop? So this is just going to outline the major details that we're going to cover. But as I said, that this workshop is probably going to be available online as well. So uh, that's something Indika Yoga and Nritya Ji are taking a decision on currently. But uh, just to let you know what those details are. It's going to be called Flight to Freedom, Exploring the Panchakosha Model and its Practical Application. So basically what we saw today was just a minor introduction and Nitya Ji will be going into complete detail about everything that she discussed today during this workshop. Please keep uh, accessing the Indica Yoga website and we will update the details if this turns from residential to online. Thank you so much, Koti Ji. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Uh, before Thank we you leave, Ji, will you do a closing mantra for us, please? Yes. Sir. Thank you. Oh, oh.
ನಮದ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಿದ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಪೂರ್ಣಮುದಚ್ಯತೆ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಓ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಅಲ್ ಸಿ ಯು ನೆಕ್ಸ್